This morning we are going to focus on Holy Spirit the Heavenly Dove. Holy Spirit the Heavenly Dove. At Jesus baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. That's what Bible says. And my key words is Matthew 3 16. After Jesus was baptized, just as he was coming out of the water, the heavens opened and saw the Spirit of God. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming on him. Is he dove? Is the symbol or the type of the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit came upon Jesus as he was coming out of the water in the form of a dove. That's what Bible says. Now in the Bible, the first time we read about the dove is in Genesis chapter 8. Is that the first time we read about the dove is in Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 8 and 9. Then Noah sent out a dove to see if the waters had receded from the surface of the ground. Verse 9. The dove could not find a resting place for its feet. Mark this verse. The dove could not find a resting place for its feet because the water still covered the surface of the entire earth. And so it returned to Noah in the ark. He stretched out his hand, took the dove, and brought it back into the ark. See, the dove was first time sent out of the ark to see whether the water had receded or not from the surface of the earth. This water was the symbol of the judgment because of men's sin. All this water was the symbol of God's judgment over the sin, over men's sin. And we read in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. The Lord commanded the man, you may freely eat fruit from every tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. You see, the judgment was already pronounced even before the sin was committed, isn't it? And so God had even beforehand announced that the day you sin, the judgment will come. And finally the judgment came on a larger scale because on a larger scale people had been sinning on the face of the earth. And Genesis 3, 7 says, Genesis 3, 7, Then the eyes of both of them opened, you see. When they committed sin, right away, they realized that they had committed sin. They, they were convicted of it, you see. And they knew they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You see, the glory of God, which was the covering for Adam and Eve, suddenly left, you see. The glory of God was covering them because they were made in the image of God. The, the, the time or the very moment they committed sin, the glory of God left them and they began to sew the fig leaves. And that's why the Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Adam and Eve realized the very moment that they have committed sin. And Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now the dove could not find a place of resting, you see. It could not rest its feet since the water had not receded and all the garbage of sin was floating on the water, you see. All the garbage and all the dead bodies and garbage were floating on the water. And so the dove came back to the ark. Now let us read Genesis 8, 6. Now let us read Genesis chapter 8, verse 6. At the end of the 40 days, Noah opened the window he made in the ark, and verse 7, and sent out a raven. He sent out a crow. He kept flying back and forth until the waters had dried up on the earth. You see, crow is an unclean bird. Yeah. Crow is a symbol of Satan, you see. Crow was sent out, but he did not return back. The crow was very comfortable with all the impurity, with all the garbage, with all the dead corpses that were floating on the water. He could sit on them, you see, and he could enjoy them. The, the crow was flying back and forth 
and did not return. Yeah. And Bible says in Job chapter 1 verse 7. Job chapter 1 verse 7. The Lord said to Satan. Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord. From roaming about on the earth. From roaming about on the earth. And from walking back and forth across it. You see he was just roaming back and forth. And so the crow did not come back. Now let us see what is the characteristics of a dove, you see. The characteristic of a dove. Dove is a clean bird. Dove is a clean bird. Dove came back because it is a clean bird. It cannot stand all the impurity and the garbage and all the dead corpses that are floating on the water. Like crow, it could not see on the dead carcasses, you see. And so the dove returned back to the ark. And since dove is a clean bird in the Old Testament, it is offered as a sacrifice, as a sin offering and as a burnt offering. Leviticus chapter 5 verse 7. Leviticus chapter 5 verse 7. And if he, that is a sinner, if a sinner is not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass, which he has committed, two turtle doves or two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering, another for a burnt offering. He has to bring, if he cannot afford a lamb, a turtle dove, you see, for his sin offering. Because dove is a clean bird. Leviticus 5 7. You see, God the Holy Spirit Himself is very holy. Holiness depicts purity, you see. He cannot dwell in impure and unholy places. The dove could not dwell, but it had to come back. He could not find a resting place. In the impurity that was floating, the garbage and the dead carcasses that were floating over the water, it could not rest its feet. It had to come back, you see. Holy Spirit cannot dwell in impure and unholy places. Holy Spirit brings purity, you see. If the Holy Spirit wants to enter a heart, what does it do first? The Holy Spirit will convict that person's heart regarding sin, righteousness and judgment. John 16 8. John 16 and 8. That the Holy Spirit will convict you regarding sin, Righteousness and judgment. If that person repents of his sin and is cleansed by the blood of Jesus, then the Holy Spirit will be able to enter that heart. But if that heart does not repent, then the Holy Spirit is grieved. And with grieving, he leaves that heart of that person. You see, two years ago, while I was, ten years ago, not two years ago, ten years ago, while I was pastoring, uh, a big church and they had a cathedral, huge cathedral building, you see. And we were living in a parsonage, a pastor's house, right by, beside the church actually. And uh, what happened was, uh, a dove was having a nest maybe in a neighboring tree in our campus, you see. And uh, two small chicks from that dove's nest, they fell, fell down and uh, I didn't want them to be hurt by dogs or the cats, you see. And so I picked up those two turtle doves, you see, those two chicks, and brought them home, you see. And we were caring for them. And 10 years ago, jo Joseph was a small kid, he was a small boy, actually. So he loved them, actually. And so we used to keep them in our home. I had a box to keep them, and uh, we kept on feeding them. So they became our pet doves, you see. And the feathers of a dove are very clean and spotless white, you see. No particle of mud or dirt or a drop of water that falls on the feathers of dove can remain on it. Because it has an oily covering on those feathers. So any particle of dust or mud or even a drop of water falls on it, it just slides down, you see. Doesn't remain on it, you see. Dove's feathers are so clean, you see. The impure environment cannot influence it. The impure inf environment cannot influence the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that's the reason, can protect us.
for all from sinful environment and can keep us away from sin. You see, the Holy Spirit can give us that protection from sinful environment that is multiplying this world. You see, and so the goal of a Christian life is purity and holiness. The goal of a Christian life or the hope of a Christian life is purity and holiness. 1 John 3.3 3. See what Bible says. 1 John 3.3 3. And everyone who has this hope focused on him that is on Jesus purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. Everyone who has this hope of Christian life has to focus on Jesus and purifies himself just as Jesus is pure in order that the Holy Spirit can dwell in our hearts, you see. We have to live in purity and holiness. He cannot dwell in an impure life. And so the first thing is purity of behavior. Purity of behavior, the Bible requires purity in our behavior, in our conduct. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. So I want the man, I want the man to pray in every place. This is a plural, man and women both. I want them to pray in every place, lifting up holy hands without anger or dispute. Without anger or dispute. Lifting up your holy hands without anger or dispute. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 says, let no one look down on you. To the young pastor, the guy who was going to be a young pastor, Timothy is in the training and Paul writes to him, Let no one look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers. In your speech, conduct, love, faithfulness and purity. Five things. He must set an example to the believers in speech, conduct, love, faithfulness and purity. Purity of conduct, purity of behavior. And second thing is purity of speech. Controlling your tongue, you see. Controlling one's tongue. We read in James chapter 3 verses 1, 2 and 5. James chapter 3 verse 1 and then verse 2 and verse 5. Not many of you should become Bible teachers. My brothers and sisters, because you know they will be judged more strictly. That's how James begins, you see. Verse 1, now not many of you should become Bible teachers by my brothers and sisters because we know that we will be judged more strictly. And verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. If someone does not stumble in what he says, if someone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect individual, able to control the entire body as well. Someone who cannot falter or stumble in his speech, you see, in speaking, you see, in what he says, then Bible calls that individual as a perfect individual. He will able to control his entire body. The hardest thing to control in the whole of your body is tongue. You know? James says that. The hardest thing to control is your tongue, actually. But if you can control it, then you can even control the rest of the body. The more you talk, the more you stumble. Even the more you talk, the more you stumble. You see? Remember, if your tongue is not controlled by the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit cannot use that tongue or use that person for God's work, you see. And that's why we need to guard our mouth. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 23. Proverbs 21 23 says, Whoso guards his mouth and his tongue, keepeth his soul from troubles. One can guard his mouth and keep his tongue. He protects his soul from trouble. And so my dear friends, 
The Holy Spirit needs to control our tongues. If He can control your tongue, then God's word can be manifested through you. For this, what do we need? For this, you need the mind of Christ, you see. You need the mind of Christ. And so the third thing is pure mind. Pure mind. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Dear friends, this is already the second letter I have written you. In which I am trying to stir up your pure mind. By the way, I am reminded, that's what Peter says to the people of the church. I am trying to stir up a pure mind within you, the members of the church. You need a pure mind. And Philippians 2 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. What kind of a mind should be in you? The mind of Jesus Christ, you see. What we need is the mind of Christ. You see. Mind of Christ can only be given to us by the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can give you the mind of Christ. Why? Because Bible says in Philippians 2 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And then we because Bible also says we need to remember that the law of sin and death is within the members of your flesh. Romans chapter 8 verse 2. Because the law of sin and death is within the members of your body. And that's the very reason the temptation comes. Why do temptation come? It's just because the law of sin and death. You have inherited it from Adam. You see? We have inherited it right in our body. And that's the very reason we need the law of life through the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8 verse 2, that can give us victory over the law of sin and death. And that's why we need is the mind of Christ, Romans chapter 12 verse 2, Romans chapter 12 verse 2, and do not be confirmed to this world, do not be confirmed to this world, that's what Bible says, but be transformed by the renewing of your Mind, your mind needs to be renewed by the transformation and reading of your mind. Do not be confirmed to this world. You see, many people leave just to get the confirmation from the world. You know that? Most of the people, they want confirmation from the world. They want the confirmation from the Hollywood. They want the confirmation from etc, etc, etc. So many things. We do not need the confirmation from the world, that's what Bible says. But be transformed by the reading of your mind. We need the transformation of our mind. We need the reading of our mind. To what extent? Up to what extent our mind should be transformed? To what extent our mind should be renewed? That you may then you may prove or you may know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Then you may know the will of God, you see, to that extent. Then you can realize the will of God. To that extent your mind is to be transformed. Otherwise, if you do not know the will of God, then you will know the will of the world. The will of the world is that you be conformed to their standards and to their way of living all the time. Otherwise, they'll put you in trouble, isn't it? One day one of the brothers came to me and said, Brother, I want the anointing to effectively minister. So I said, well, first, what you need is the reading of your mind. You need to have the mind of Christ, the anointed one. If you have the mind of the anointed one, then his anointing will be upon you, you see. If you do not have the mind of the anointed one, how can you have then his anointing?
anointing upon you, see? And to what extent? To that extent that we can know the will of God. That we can know His will. And what is ministry, see? Ministry is nothing but knowing and doing the will of God. That's it. Ministry is nothing but knowing and doing the will of God. If you do not know the will of God, you will make your own plans and your own things and they will never succeed actually. Yeah. Yeah. Because God is not working with you. If God has to work with you and through you, then you cannot carry out your own plans in ministry. You have to carry out the plans of whose ministry? Ministry belongs to? Jesus. Jesus. Ministry belongs to God. And that's why we need to know His will, you see. And that can happen only by the transformation of your mind. Reading of your mind that you may prove, you may know what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The fourth thing is pure heart. Pure heart. If the Holy Spirit is to come and dwell within us, then He will dwell in a pure heart. Otherwise, we will go back. And so Bible requires pure heart from us. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. First Timothy 1 5. But the aim of our instruction is love. That comes from a pure heart, good conscience, and a sincere faith. That is what Paul writes to Timothy. And if God has to use you, Timothy, then it has to come from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Hebrews 10 22. Hebrews 10 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart. If you have to draw near to God, then you have to draw near with a sincere heart in the assurance of that faith brings because we have had our hearts sprinkled clean from an ill conscience. We have had our hearts sprinkled clean from ill conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. You see, pure hearts. It is to the pure heart that the Holy Spirit can draw near. It is to the pure hearts that can draw closer to God actually. Pure hearts can draw nearer to God. And Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. Matthew 5 8. Blessed are the what? Do you know the Beatitudes? Blessed are the Pure in heart, for they shall see God. But they can see God. Who can see God? Only those who are pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Daniel could see the visions of God. Why? Daniel could see the visions of God because Daniel 1.8. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself. What did he do? He will not corrupt himself. He will not make himself impure. He would not defile himself. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the royal food of the royal wine. Royal wine. See, this food was any cheap food. No cheap food, you see. This was the most costliest food you can get in the whole empire of Babylon, isn't it? This was the royal food coming from the royal kitchen, you see. Cooked with the best spices and best elements. And even then, this man said he would not defile himself with the royal food of the royal mind. He therefore asked the overseer of the court officials for permission not to defile himself. This man was bent on keeping himself pure. 
And since Daniel had an undefiled heart, since Daniel had an undefiled heart, he had a pure heart, the Holy Spirit could reside in Daniel. That's what Bible says. The Holy Spirit could reside within Daniel. And this big difference, the pagan king would realize it. Even the pagan king like Nebuchadnezzar, he could make out that difference. Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, did not know the Holy Spirit. He did not know about the Holy Spirit. But he knew something was different in this man. And we read in Daniel 4, chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, and then verse 18. Daniel chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, and then verse 18. This is the language of a pagan king. See the pagan words also show up in these verses. The pagan king did not know the Holy Spirit. But he realized the presence of some Holy Spirit in the life of Daniel. And this is what he says. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Bethesazar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. You see? In whom is the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. That's what this man does not have a definition of the Holy Spirit. So he makes up his own pagan language and he says, In whom is the Spirit of the Holy Ghost? And before him I told the dream, saying, Verse 9, O Bethesazar, Master of the Magicians. Was Daniel the Master of Magicians? No. This is a pagan language actually. He is the saint of God, or he is a prophet of God. As simple and as good as that. But he says, because I know, verse 9, that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. And no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the reasons of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. I know the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Even a pagan king would realize that. And then we read in verse 18. This dream I King Nebuchadnezzar have seen. Nebuchadnezzar confirms the dream that Daniel narrates to him. Yes, what you say is correct, he said. And then he says, Now you O Bethesda, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation. But thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. He can tell the difference between the other royal wise men and between Daniel. The other royal wise men are not able to give the interpretation. But you are able to give the interpretation, Daniel. Why? Because the spirit of the holy gods, I know, is in you. Is in you. And so what we need is the Holy Spirit's dwelling place. When Jesus came out of the water, he did not have to take baptism, isn't it? Because he was not a sinner, right? The baptism is for sinners, actually. Jesus was not at all a sinner. But in spite of that, he took the baptism. In that baptism, he was surrendering himself to become a sacrifice for all the sinners. He was surrendering, Jesus was surrendering himself to the will of God over his life. John said, Jesus, you need not take baptism. In fact, I have to take baptism from your hands. But Jesus said, allow it for now. That all righteousness may be fulfilled. Allow me to take the baptism. And John allowed it. And Jesus was submitting himself to become the sacrifice of our salvation. To take away the sins of the whole world upon himself. To be marred by the sins of the whole world. And he was taking that baptism. And when he came out, 
fulfilling and submitting himself to the will of God. What happened? As soon as he submitted to the will of God's God's will, what happened? The Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Like a dove. The Holy Spirit will descend upon you if you submit to the will of God. But before that can happen, Romans 12 2 should happen. Be transformed by the reading of your mind that you may know what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God in your life. You need the transformation of your mind. You need the renewing of your mind that you can realize the will of God and you can submit to do the will of God. And then Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You'll be able to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, shall we pray. My dear friends, be not be conformed, do not be conformed to the world. Instead, be transformed by the reading of your mind. Let the Holy Spirit and the Word of God renew your mind to that extent that you can know the will of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Ask the Lord, Lord cleanse me, wash me by your blood, make me clean and holy, take away every confirmation of the world that is within me and within my life, remove it Lord, it will be painful when it starts happening, let me go. But let it go, crucify it. And let the true cleansing begin so that the Holy Spirit will come into your heart. Daniel resolved in his heart he will not define himself. Can we have a strong resolution in our heart? That in 2012 and beyond I'll keep myself undefined. I'll resolve not to define myself. Spirit of God, cleanse me with the blood and walk into my life. Thank you for speaking to us, Lord, through your word. Help us to be the doers of your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.